Okay, so um, I, you didn't touch too much on it um, in your presentation, Mike, uh, but I'd like to uh, present the first case of a recurrent rotator cuff tendon tear. Um, and uh, I know both of you are interested in dr drinking wine, and so this is a gentleman who's 55 years old, right hand dominant, he's a cellar worker, we need to keep him working. Um, and in May of 2019, he sustained a fall at work and had a significant alteration in his left shoulder function. Uh, he had and developed severe pain and weakness. Now, interestingly, he had a rotator cuff repair on the left side in 2007, so 12 years prior. Uh, when he presented to me after being referred from another physician who, was, uh, who uh, primarily managed his workers' compensation uh, injury, uh, when he came to me, he had active port flexion of 60, a lot of pain with that. Um, so uh, with some assistance, I could get him up to 155. So I did not detect that he had much of a capsular contracture. He had active external rotation of 25, internal rotation to the lumbar sickle spine, very weak forward flexion, uh, and Job's testing external rotation of four plus over five and his uh, belly press was intact. So uh, as is uh, my usual practice, uh, we obtained uh, AP and axillary x-rays, which you can see um, before you. And he actually um, showed up in my office uh, with an MRI. And so um, go ahead and show these to you uh, right here. So this is, is uh, actually, obviously is coronal uh, MRI. And uh, as Mike uh, pointed out previously, the um, scapular Y view, uh, sagittal oblique image with T2. Moving further lateral, a T2, sagittal oblique, and then an axillary. So um, just uh, want to backtrack a little bit um, on, the, uh, on the MRI. And uh, so uh, Heinz, can you just give me, a, give me your impressions of what you're seeing here on this, uh, on this MRI? And when you're looking at a patient like this and trying to think about options, um, what patient factors are you thinking about and how are you correlating that with, with this MRI? Yeah, so thanks, uh, Jim. So on the... Uh coronal view, I, I don't see any rotator cuff um, above the uh, humeral head. However, we have to remember this is only one slice that, that could be, the tear could only be five millimeters wide and you might have that picture. And also we see the humeral head is riding high, but again, in the absence of a ro rotator cuff, but with the patient lying in the scanner, you can't say that this is upward migration. Um, as we see on plane films. Um, on the uh, sagittal view, we see you know, the rotator cuff going up to, to the tangential line. And I had a question for uh, Michael, is just how do you know on a sagittal view where to, which slice to choose? How deep do you go in case the, if the tendon's retracted, it's gonna look different than if it's re repaired. And can you expa uh, expand on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's pretty hotly debated. I, I you know, this view that uh, that Jim has here, kind of giving you that goalpost look. I think that you, to me, I just want to get to the point where I can see both the, you know, to get the true why. Sometimes the MRI won't take you over medial enough, but you are correct in the fact that if you have a lot of retraction, and there are certainly studies that are trying to. Uh, ask how far you have to go over, but I'll usually go just where I can see the Y here. And I know that if I can get that view and the muscle belly is not big enough or is under that tangent line, then that's probably pretty at risk. Right. So the two other views I would want to see for sure would be the sagittal view out lateral at the level of, of the uh, there, that one. So you can see how far is the muscles retracted anterior and posteriorly, and then, and then the axillary review for the subscapularis uh, primarily. Jim, is that so, what you were thinking? Yeah. Yeah. So Heinz, um, uh, 
when you have that uh, when you have that MRI with a superior um, superiorly migrated uh, humeral head, do you usually get a a, a plain X-ray? Think that's uh, that's helpful in analyzing um, what force couple remains. Exactly. I I will not comment on superior migration without a plain film, because the plain film should be taken with the patient upright, and that's where if the head's superiorly sublux, that's where it really means something. Okay. So, um, Mike uh, obviously sh showed some fantastic um, surgical technique in being able to mobilize the large tendon. And so, uh, Mike, now we have a guy here who had 12 years ago a rotator cuff repair, um, seemingly would, did well until just recently. And he's got this tendon that you see here on the MRI. Do you have any um, insight? into how mobile this tendon would be at this point? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's another great point. It's uh, so often, I think that it, at least in my experience, and both of you have much more experience than me, but it's there's so often you go in expecting more mobilization and you don't get it, even with what you think are thorough releases. And there's other times that you uh, go in expecting not to have much mobilization and you get a little bit more. So I, I think it's you, what you've shown here is, is going to give you the best, you know, you go in thinking that this, I would go in thinking this is going to be problematic um, to get to the medial row, but that's where my mind would be thinking kind of the principles I was thinking, but I think it's very hard to routinely predict whether or not you're going to be able to get out in a tear this big. Okay, so you have sort of, uh, so you have a dynamic uh, plan here, it sounds like, Mike. Correct. So uh, I saw him um, again in uh, May of 2019, and um, I recommended uh, and performed an injection and sent him to physical therapy because he had not had that. And um, I, I was concerned that it was not a repairable tear. It did not show to me characteristics of an acute tear that I needed to rush in and do anything. So I tried that, but unfortunately it didn't work. Um, and two months later he re returned, still pretty miserable, really poor range of motion, basically non-functional shoulder. And so that's when I started thinking about, you know, what options that um, I have surgically. And it sounds like um, Mike might've been alluding to an arthroscopy where you can kind of go in and check it out and check and see what the tendon's doing. And um, and then maybe go uh, go from there. Um, um, any 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 uh, further elaboration on your on your on your plan that you started to elucidate there, Mike? Before? Yeah, so you have a lot of great options here. I mean, in this, the, a lot. Uh, it's to me, the guy's fifty five years old, and you know, so I'm going to take it and he's an active worker. So this changes the game plan of versus someone who's older uh, and a bit more sedentary. Um, so uh, out of the list there, I think that some things would be out, you know, I wouldn't do a reverse in this person and you already attempted conservative management. So now what? Well, partial repair might be able to work with some of those principles. I think that an SCR, which uh, Heinz will talk to us about is well in the potential wheelhouse here, that bursal acromial reconstruction, which is basically a, kind of the reverse of a SCR, putting it on the, on the undersurface of the acromion, it's much cheaper. Uh, and there's been some early work that shows some promise there. I don't think that this person needs a transfer and I'd be interested to know your guys experience because although he has a lot of weakness in his superior cuff, his external rotation was still four. So, you know, unless they have really poor external rotation, I'm gonna shy away from the transfers. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, and I did not mean this to be a complete list. And so, uh, Heinz, I'm curious if you have any other ideas or if, you're, if you have anything to, any, any uh, distinctions uh, with respect to your uh, thoughts on this case. Well, I actually think that I'm fairly confident that I could repair this one because if you look at that sagittal again, uh, the the distance between the anterior and posterior is only about 17 millimeters. Is what is that? What do you have there? I'm not sure, but uh, 
And when I see that uh, infraspinatus kind of buckled up in the back, and then I, I'm thinking that there's a, I don't know, 50-50 chance that, or 70, whatever, that I can pull it. In. It's going to be an anterior posterior repair, not a medial lateral repair. Okay. It's going to be a side to side with the fixation laterally, um, and some it all depends on how mobile that posterior uh, part. Sometimes it's the anterior that's mobile, but usually it buckles in the back. I call this a roll top desk repair because you pull it up uh, and do and. Uh, but I'm not sure if that's what's going to happen. But that's what this is one I would be suspicious about. So sometimes you get an MRI like this, Heinz, if, if I'm just to make sure I understand, it's retracted, but you can sort of reach back medially and posterior. And then as you pull that tendon forward and lateral, you get some pretty good excursion and ability to close the defect. Is that, is that what, you're, what you're alluding to there? Yeah, well, sometimes it's a longitudinal tear and you have a coronal view. And if you only look at a few coronal views, it'll, it looks like it's torn beyond the glenoid. But Really, what's happened? It's a longitudinal tear, and uh, and it fell back uh, or forward, but usually uh, it falls back. If you just pull it almost straight forward and lateral, you can do a long, you know, con margin convergence, and then uh, it actually might all come back. And uh, just to emphasize, this is a recurrent tear. Does that change uh, your thought process at all? Yeah, anything can happen with the recurrent tear. In fact, sometimes that they have more because they've had more medial or sutures in it, and the tissue isn't that good. The tears can be all different directions. So, uh, but it, but but you have to paint caution because often the tissue is not as healthy to work with. Of course. Okay. Well, let me uh, tell you what I did, and we'll follow this case out a little bit. Um, I decided to go in and perform arthroscopic surgery and take a look and see if I could repair it. Unfortunately, when I got there, the there was no mobility to the tendon and there was no uh, way to close the gap with the native tissue. And so uh, what I chose to do was a, um, let me turn this back, was do a, a superior capsular reconstruction. And this is just, you know, one way to do it. This is the greater tuberosity, uh, and for those of you who haven't done this before, you load the anchors in first, uh, do some measurements. This little measurement tool is kind of convenient to use. Figure out how big your graft is going to be. And, um, and then once you figure that out, you take these sutures outside the body, pass them to the, uh, to the graft. And then the graft can be passed in. And, and, and as you can see, you got a pretty good view of it. You know, when, the when there's not much tendon there, it really gives you a lot of space to move around and work. And, and uh, this is just a technique tying it now medially uh, to the glenoid. And then um, once you got that down, you can come back and uh, get your lateral uh, fixation. And then th in, this circum in this particular situation, I did a double row. And uh, this particular uh, suture uh, technique is nice. It's sort of pre-made for this kind of, this kind of um, uh, surgery. Um, so there's a whole bunch of questions you can ask about technique. Um, just look at the, at the pictures here. Um, this is the lateral row. That's the medial row. And then I was able to incorporate sutures from the graft into the uh, infraspinatus, which is what you're seeing there, and actually get some sutures from the uh, lateral anterior graft into that subscapularis. Um, and so... Um, uh, and th so that's what I chose to do. So um, any comments uh, on that, uh, Heinz? That looks really nice. So um, so you repaired it posteriorly and anteriorly. Um, I'm interested in both of your opinions. Uh, Mahat originally uh, would just repair it posteriorly and not anteriorly to avoid binding it. But, you know, I've done both. Uh, uh, do you try to repair the rotator renal to the subscap? and posteriorly in each case or what do you both think about that so, uh go ahead mike um well i think it was a great technique jim i it's a and it's a great question heinz I, i've kind of followed the mahata uh thought process there with his studies and i'll 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 repair to the to what's left of the infra just like jim did here 
my question for Jim was, uh, sometimes I feel that it's easier to pass the sutures before. I think it's tricky, uh, but you, maybe you have some clues or some hints of do you, when do you pass those sutures? Because it does cause extra sutures that you have to deal with. And as far as the anterior question, it's interesting, Heinz, because I, I've heard of a lot of people who do that and it does make some, some sense, but uh, I've just never done it. Yeah, I, I will if, there, if there's tissue there, that's, but I won't, I won't go to the hard part of the subscapularis, so I don't wanna to create too much tension, but if there's soft rotator interval tissue, I, I, will, use, I will use that. Uh, but I, I don't. I don't go overboard trying to seal it completely. Yeah, I, I, I was sort of subtle in the way I said this and sort of snuck it in. But an anterior lateral, you know, it was really that that lateral um, section of the rotator interval where there's it's not creating a lot of tension. It's not hauling the subscap up. It's more that lateral section just to get a little bit of closure there. And then uh, and then posteriorly, it's it. it I mean, if the tendon's just sitting there like it was in this case, it's not very difficult to do. And for me, just a couple simple sutures and and uh, boom, it's uh, it's done. And and uh, I I think that you know why this works and how it works. Um, there's a lot of theory and and again, hard to know. But I do think that that just adding those sutures, uh, especially posteriorly, and if you get something anteriorly. I think it stabilizes the graft a little bit, um, and probably it. And my 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 personal theory, although it's, I don't think it's um, shown in the literature, I think that it probably will res help you to resist getting this piece of collagen, you know, detached from the anchors that you have medially and laterally. It gives a little bit more structure to the construct. So, so I have a my question. For you, guys, if if you don't have any infraspinatus, will you try to go down and get some of that capsular tissue down by the teres minor and bring it up just to get something to close that gap down there? Or what? Or what do you guys do? Yes, for me. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think if it's easy, that's fine. But I think if it's, um, I think I don't want to. I don't want to take some you know, take some piece of tissue tied into there and then have it hog on the, uh, the, the, the graft and then have it detach the graft laterally. But yeah, I think whatever you can do to kind of close it up and make it tidy and neat is helpful. Jim, do you, how many anchors do you do on the glenoid? Just two. Double loaded? Yeah, so double loaded and you get, uh, and you end up getting two separate suture constructs there immediately. Yeah, that's nice. So, um, so this is um, uh, this is November um, when we did this surgery. Um, of course, it takes four months to get it approved on workers' comp. So, about seven months later, he's completed 24 physical therapy visits. He has persistent pain and weakness, and he's unhappy. Um, his active forward flexion is 135. Active abduction is 90. External rotation is 30. Internal rotation is L5. And he has forward flexion strength of four. External and internal are, are very good. Belly press is normal. And you may recall that when he presented to me, he had active forward flexion of only about 60 and was much more limited. So at this point, um, I did obtain uh, x-rays and these are his x-rays. Um, and so I was uh, Curious uh, what um, what your thoughts are, Mike. Uh, now uh, seven months and, and uh, seemingly some objective improvements, but subjectively not happy. Um, what would you be thinking about right now? You know, this is the reality to the, to a, a lot of these procedures. I think. I mean, right there, you're the if you just look at the numbers, he's better. And, um, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to build that much strength. I think I've had patients exactly like this. So if it's seven months, you know, I'd probably perform, uh, an injection to try to determine, you know, sometimes if you do, depending on your construct, if you tie a lot of the knots, me medial, you know, if you do tie, uh, you can get some knot issues. 
most of these for the most part are, are not list, so that's not an issue. Um, but this becomes a, a tricky situation. So I think I, I would inject would be would be my next step. Okay. Um, well, uh, what I did uh, is um, I went for some further imaging and uh, I just want to jump straight there with the further imaging uh, because I wanted to see what the graph was doing. And, um, uh, and I agree with you, Mike. I mean, further imaging or PT might be the thing to do right away. But Heinz, what do you think about this, uh, about this imaging here? So the, the graph just probably torn itself at the glenoid side. So that begs the question of whether the graft is moving and, and bothering him. Uh, so my guess, are you asking maybe whether, begs the question whether you should do a debridement to see what he has after that, I suppose. Okay. Um, Mike, any, any comments? Um, uh, you just keep stand your ground there on the injection at this point, or uh, would you do something? Well, if, I, if I if I if I had if I had this MRI, or you did an injection and it, let's say it improved transiently and it went away, and now this is the MRI, I would do the same. Uh, my thought process is the same as Heinz. I would be thinking that failure off the glenoid and probably debriding this to see what his pain relief is. Okay, so. Um, why do people's, why does pain go away um, in, in a patient who does not have static superior subluxation and you put a graft in, why does their pain g get better? Good is it, question. is it, again, is it just, the, is it, you know, is it padding between the, uh, the acromion and the humerus? Um, obviously he's not in a, in a standing x-ray, he's not going superior, but, but what are we doing? That's a mystery, especially since there's a few articles out there that show that the uh, pain relief was the same whether the graft remained intact or not. So <laughs> this is an ongoing challenge for us. Right, and this is significant. I, I don't know whether it's 20% or so. I've got the numbers later on, but uh, retail rate immediately. So, so um, I, I, I was looking at this thinking, well, you know, it's detached medially, but perhaps it's uh, it's it's um, perhaps it's, it's some of those side to side stitches are holding it and at least keeping it stable and perhaps giving it that pad that it needs and and so I explained this to him and um, and said I, I think that he should give it more time and uh, and see what happens with time because I felt like if he made so much improvement in seven months, maybe we would see something different, but I'll be honest with you, I was pretty skeptical. And uh, um, so lo and behold, he comes back at, at six months and you know, you see his, his chart in the door and you're just dreading going in and talking to him. But I walked in and he says he's doing great. And so his pain <laughs> was greatly reduced. Um, he was back to work, he was avoiding heavy lifting. He had you know good numbers as you can see and then um, He's still a little weak in forward flexion, but this is his uh, this is his end clinical result. And uh, um, so, I, I think I took away from this uh, that, uh, and I think we both know we all know this that it can take up to a year to get you know all your all, all of your benefit from a particular operation. And and I I feel like those side to side sutures may have really stabilized this graft in spite of the fact that it got detached immediately. So. I think it gave some um, some uh, affirmation that that's an important step of this operation, at least for me. So, Mike, what, 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 what comments do you have, Mike? Uh, anything about this? No, I think that this matches up well with, you know, there's not a ton of literature, but it's getting to be more robust. And, and when they do do uh, imaging, uh, we do know that uh, it fails at the glenoid side more often and that a number of those people go on to have pain relief, even, even though you think that it might be problematic. So, you know, that, and that, that's why I mentioned that bursal acromial reconstruction, not to get off, off uh, target here, but, you know, it's basically, is it, is it truly that, that, that a SCR is 
doing anything biomechanically or, or, or is it that you have a, a, you know, interpositional graft that's, you know, decreasing the bone on bone, probably pain generation. I don't know, but it's something to think yeah. about. Okay. That's a good lesson, Jim, about waiting to see what the body does with it. Yeah. Jim, would anything have pushed your hand to jump in? Like once you saw that MRI? I, I think if he had had uh, mechanical symptoms, mm, okay. uh, that would have pushed my hand. Yeah, uh, no, it's a great point you guys make, you know, be patient sometimes. But I, I really didn't think that, that he was a good candidate for a reverse shoulder replacement because he had intact articular surfaces. He had good range of motion um, and good strength. And I'm leery of, of doing arthroplasty on patients who, who have purely pain from a failed rotator cuff operation. And, and so I really felt like um, in the absence of mechanical symptoms, I'm not sure what I could have accomplished arthroscopically. Um, maybe, yeah, the thought occurred to me, maybe trying to re-repair the medial flap um, or debride it, but I just, I, I just wasn't confident in what I was gonna accomplish arthroscopically, so I just held off. 